In the late 1940s, the US rocket program hit a wall, but not that concrete wall. We're talking about the sound barrier. No one had ever been able to successfully fly supersonic, that is, faster than the speed of sound. And unless the sound barrier could be broken, aviation was just about at the end of its ability to advance. And so was the dream of space travel. To counter this problem, NACA, the predecessor to NASA, developed the X-Plane program. But the X-Planes did a lot more than just breaking the sound barrier. Since the first successful flight by the Wright brothers in December of 1903, the aviation technology of powered airplanes had made huge advancements. But as airplanes got more stable and faster over the next 40 years, the future of aviation seemed to be in serious jeopardy. During World War II, high-performance fighters like the Lockheed P-38 Lightning were capable of high-speed dives. But as those dives approached Mach 1, the speed of sound, the airplane would shake violently and the nose would tuck under, negating elevator or rudder input. As a result, many airplanes could not get out of the dives before hitting the ground or the shaking would break the aircraft apart. As attempts of performing a successful supersonic flight failed one after the other, a variety of theories emerged, like how there was an actual invisible wall in the sky that could not be crossed, and how the pilot's voice would get stuck in their throat if they surpassed the speed of sound, and my favorite, how time itself would reverse during a supersonic flight, and the pilot would emerge from the flight younger. But the truth is, no one really knew. After some investigation, it turned out that this instability was due to the compressibility effect. At speeds approaching and immediately surpassing the speed of sound, also known as transonic speeds, air compresses, forming shock waves that behave very differently than air moving at slower speeds. The P-38 center of pressure, where the forces of lift and drag are exerted, actually moved back toward the tail when flying transonic, causing that instability. It soon became obvious to NACA that further study of the effects of compressibility was going to be limited by the brief time that propeller-driven aircraft could dive in order to achieve and maintain transonic speeds and thus the requirement for an aircraft that could achieve this speed in straight and level flight was equally obvious. By the way, do you think that P-38 would have been able to fly supersonic on the moon, given the moon's lesser gravity? We'll get to that later. The X-Plane's concept officially came into being in 1944 as a joint program between the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, the U.S. Army Air Force, and the U.S. Navy. Later on, NACA became the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, the U.S. Army Air Force became the U.S. Air Force, and the U.S. Navy, well, those guys still identify as U.S. Navy. Other organizations, such as DARPA and the U.S. Marine Corps, have also since sponsored X-Plane projects. The goal of the X-Plane program was to pursue research into high-speed aircraft. That's why the X designation was originally XS for Experimental Supersonic. Obviously, once the supersonic barrier was overcome, the later X-Planes focused on other new technologies related to control and maneuverability of aircraft and so on. But the very first X-Plane, the X-1, was a massive success. The X-1 was a joint effort of NACA, the Army Air Force, and the Bell Aircraft Corporation, which was contracted to build this experimental aircraft. If you're wondering why the Bell Aircraft Corporation was chosen, it was because all other traditional contractors were busy pumping out airplanes for World War II, and the Bell Corporation had some time on their hands. Researchers were all in agreement that a new type of aircraft needed to be designed, but they did not all agree on the design. As a compromise, the decision was made to pursue two designs in parallel. 
NACA and the Air Force teamed up with the Bell Aircraft Corporation to build the rocket-powered X-1 aircraft, while NACA and the Navy worked with the Douglas Aircraft Company to create the jet-powered D-558-1 Sky Streak. This dual approach could provide a greater chance of success in a transonic research program. The body of the X-1 was modeled after the 50 caliber bullet. Why? Because the Second Amendment and the NRA lobbying scientists. That's my theory. Alternate facts suggest it was because the 50 caliber bullet was one of the only things known to be stable at transonic and supersonic speeds. The four-chamber rocket engine on the X-1 had no throttle and could only provide two and a half minutes of powered flight, which is why the X-1 had to be air-launched from a specially modified B-29 Superfortress. Three different X-1s were to be built, designated X-11 to X-13. There were also other variations like the X-1A to X-1E. And in December of 1945, only nine months after inception, I mean after the Bell Aircraft Corporation was contracted to build the plane, the first X-1 was ready. In January of 1946, the X-11 was air-launched from a B-29 Superfortress for the first time. This was an unpowered flight. Powered flights began in December of that year. And finally, on October 14, 1947, on its 50th flight, the X-11, piloted by Air Force Captain Charles Yeager, reached a speed of 700 miles per hour at an altitude of 43,000 feet, becoming the first aircraft to exceed the speed of sound. Following burnout of the engine, the airplane safely glided back and landed. This not only proved supersonic flights possible, the personnel involved helped lay the foundation of America's space program in the 1960s and the flight data collected over the X-1's 238 flights provided the basis for American supremacy in a... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Not that supremacy. American supremacy in aviation in the second half of the 20th century. It should be obvious that those involved in the X-plane program had to employ creative problem-solving and critical thinking to overcome the obstacles that they came across. Well, we're gonna do the same thing when answering the question that we asked earlier about the P-38 going supersonic on the moon. And we'll do that with help from Brilliant, the sponsor of today's video. Interactive learning is what Brilliant's fun, hands-on lessons are all about. It's not about memorizing, it's about understanding. So let's take a look at the lesson on how airplanes fly. The main thing to understand is how lift works. Brilliant uses the example of a kite. As the air hits the underside of the kite, the air is bent downward. This bent air, according to Newton's third law, applies an equal opposite force to the kite, which pushes it up. And that force is called lift. And if the lift force is more than the force of gravity, the kite flies. But if there is no air or atmosphere to bend, there is no lift. And those are the conditions on the surface of the moon. So no airplane can take off from the moon, let alone going supersonic. That's why we need rockets. See, with an intuitive explanation, no matter what your knowledge level is, you can start a brilliant course that interests you. Anything from science to technology and engineering. And you'll see how STEM is relevant to your everyday life. So why not get started for free? Join the millions of people already learning on Brilliant. Go to brilliant.org slash not what you think because the first 200 listeners will also get 20% off an annual membership. And that is brilliant. Similarly to the X-1, the X-2 was built for the US Air Force by the Bell Aircraft Company, which evidently still wasn't very busy. The X-2 was a swept-wing, rocket-powered aircraft designed to go further in investigating high-speed aerodynamics and thermal effects when operating at speeds exceeding Mach 3 at altitudes between 100,000 and 130,000 feet. The X-2's rocket engine had more than twice the thrust compared to the X-1's. One notable improvement on the X-2 
was the introduction of ejectable nose capsules. They would have added ejection seats. It's just that at the time, ejection seats had not quite reached maturity, so the aircraft nose would eject instead. Even though the X-2 program had a prolonged development period to allow the science and technologies required for the project to catch up, the X-2's research career was quite short, and you can probably guess why. The first accident happened on the first X-2 while testing its liquid oxygen system. After an in-flight explosion while still attached to the B-50 mothership, the X-2 was jettisoned. The X-2, its test pilot John Ziegler, as well as Frank Walco, a crew member from the B-50, tragically fell a reported 30,000 feet into Lake Ontario. The bodies and the wreck of the X-2 were never recovered. The B-50 was badly damaged but safely made it back to the Niagara Falls airfield. After long delays, the second X-2 began a series of gradual steps toward Mach 3. On September 7, 1956, Air Force Captain Ivan Kinchelow set a world altitude record by flying the X-2 to 126,000 feet. He had gone so high that there was not enough air for the controls to be effective, so he couldn't even alter the flight path of the aircraft until it had returned to the denser atmosphere below. These were truly uncharted territories. Only 20 days later, Captain Milburn Apt took the X-2 to a record speed of Mach 3.2 at 65,500 feet. It will never be known exactly what happened next. But while still above Mach 3, as the pilot attempted a sharp turn back to the base, the X-2 tumbled violently out of control. With no luck regaining control, the pilot jettisoned the ejection capsule, but he never got a chance to bail out of the capsule and use his personal parachute. After falling for several minutes, Mel Apt was sadly killed upon impact. This accident ended the X-2 research program after only performing a mere 20 flights. NACA never had a chance to even begin detailed flight research with the X-2 aircraft. The search for answers to high mock flight questions had to be postponed for two years until the arrival of the most advanced of all X-planes. In the early 1950s, scientists and engineers started to look at the possibility of manned spaceflight with help from the personnel, equipment, and data taken from Nazi Germany's rocketry program. A new aircraft was needed, one that could reach the edges of space, and to do that, it would have to achieve speeds exceeding 4,100 miles per hour, altitudes of 150,000 feet, and with sand temperatures of up to 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit due to air friction. Man, we keep using the imperial system. Let me say that part again in a way that everyone would understand. They had to design an aircraft capable of flying more than twice as fast as a bullet fired from a high-powered rifle. An airplane that could be as hot as all the 1950s Playboy cover girls having fun together. An aircraft that could get as high as Snoop Dogg on a Tuesday brunch. There, that's what they're trying to build. But kidding aside, this airplane was so fast and would fly so high that a special flight corridor known as the High Range was created for it. 485 by 50 miles stretched from Wendover, Utah to Edwards Air Force Base in California. So that's what the X-15 was about. And in 1954, a contract was awarded to North American Aviation to build this seemingly impossible airplane. Some of the new technologies developed for the X-15 included the first practical pilot pressure suits, a rocket engine that had a throttle, an ejection system to protect the pilot at four times the speed of sound, high-speed wind tunnels to test aerodynamic heating at Mach 5 plus, and large centrifuges to test pilot response to prolonged gravity loads. 
When flying in the dense air of the usable atmosphere, the X-15 used conventional aerodynamic controls such as rudders and movable horizontal stabilizers. But for flight in the thin air outside of the Earth atmosphere, the X-15 used a reaction control system. Hydrogen peroxide thrust rockets located on the nose and the wings will provide pitch, roll, and yaw control. The X-15 flew faster than any fixed-wing manned aircraft at 4,520 miles per hour, or Mach 6.7, at an altitude of 102,100 feet. An official record set in 1967 that has not yet been broken. Over a period of eight years or so, 12 different pilots flew the X-15 for a total of 199 flights. Eight of those pilots qualified as astronauts by reaching an altitude of over 50 miles. Among them was Neil Armstrong. But the X-15 program was not without hiccups. On its 74th flight, the rocket engine on the X-15 stopped responding to throttle input. The pilot quickly shut off the engine and started dumping the fuel in preparation for emergency landing. But he couldn't finish the process in time. During landing, the extra weight of the excess fuel caused the main landing gear to crash. The pilot survived, but suffered a serious spinal injury that forced him into early retirement. In total, there were three major accidents involving the X-15, and luckily, none of them were fatal. Perhaps the most significant contribution of the X-15 program was demonstrating that a high-performance reusable vehicle could be flown outside Earth's atmosphere by a pilot, then re-enter and perform a successful unpowered landing. Technologies and techniques developed for the X-15 program would go on to influence the space shuttle and other spacecraft. Thermal protection, navigation equipment and landing techniques used on the X-15 were also used on the Saturn launch vehicle during the Apollo program. However, some of the biggest benefits reaped by the space program from the X-15 did not come from hardware or technology, but from intangible assets, people and their experiences. Some of those involved in the X-15 program ended up holding key leadership positions in the space program, like Walt Williams, who became the operations director of Project Mercury and Gemini programs, and NACA research pilot Neil Armstrong, who had evaluated the use of reaction controls with the X-15. He went on to apply his knowledge to the Apollo program, hand-flying the lunar landing module that landed on the moon in July of 1969. One small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. From the sound barrier to the moon. Da, 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 da.